This is the last in our little short series on rest. Just four short weeks, which seems utterly ridiculous when you consider that rest is the destination that God has promised for us. It's the operating system of what it means to be a new creation, and it goes right to the heart of our salvation. The finished work of God through the second Adam, Jesus our Savior, who has returned us to Eden and brought us back to rest. How could we have only spent four weeks on that? It's a big deal. And as I've said throughout um, this series, it's way more significant. Finding rest is way more significant than seeking a better work-life balance, reordering our priorities list, or ruthlessly eliminating hurry. In fact, uh, rest is not about any of that stuff at all. So this week, this last week, we're going to wrap it up. And what a day to wrap it up. Pentecost Sunday, come on. Thank you. It's the perfect perfect day to look at uh, our final topic, which is authority. And there are two halves to this sermon. First, I want to share some scriptures with you and draw out a thread that connects rest with power and authority. And then I want to look at how Jesus operated in power and authority from a place of rest in Mark 4. But we've got a lot of passages to go for. So here is a biblical odyssey. Let's hit the word. And everything's going to appear on your screens. It would be too much hassle to look them up. We're going to start Genesis 1, 24 to 31. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. The livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over. Everyone say, rule over. With feeling. It's better. It's the Bible. It's meant to be fun. <clears throat> the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. I'm going to jump to verse 31. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Hebrews 2, 1 to 11. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience receives its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God let nothing that is not subject God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it is fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. 
So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. John 1, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him yet. To all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Merry Christmas. Psalm 46.10. That was... Okay, fine. Psalm, 40, <laughs> Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. Luke 24.49. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay or remain in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Acts 2, 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Last one for now, John 15, 1 to 4. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, why have I just read that selection of scriptures? Because as I was dwelling on them this week, I couldn't help seeing, and I really hope I could communicate this, I couldn't help seeing a thread to be discovered throughout those scriptures that reveals a spiritual law that I want to teach today, which is that, John, authority flows from rest. Authority flows from rest. Throughout this series, I've said that um, biblical rest is not about changing our circumstances, right? It's about living permanently connected to Holy Spirit in us, no matter our circumstances. It's found in Him. So it is to Holy Spirit that we go to learn how to live in rest. We turn inward to him, not outward to the world, right? This is not about outward circumstances. It's about communion with the indwelling presence of God. Please note that in Scripture, we are invited to enter his rest, not enter our own rest. Which means that rest is not something to experience once the storm has passed, or we've been rescued by, uh, from the storm by God, who is like a sort of cosmic Coast Guard helicopter pilot who can find us out at sea and winch us to safety. Rather, rest is something that is meant to be and must be experienced in the middle of the storm. And that is really important for us to learn. Because what we're going to discover today is that rest actually has authority over circumstances, not the other way around. Which means that to live in the sort of peace that we all crave and which our culture and our busy lives war against, we don't change our circumstances to find rest. We enter rest to change our circumstances. Right? So that, that is what I am saying today. Rest carries power to change circumstances. Because it is from rest that spiritual authority flows. Okay? So let's trace this thread that I, that I saw in these passages that I've just read. In the Genesis 1 reading, we jump back to creation, okay? It's the sixth day. God creates all the creatures and us humans. And we noted in week one of this series that Adam and Eve's first experience of life was God's seventh day. 
right? They entered into his rest from day one. So their life wasn't toil, it wasn't co-labor. Sorry, it wasn't toil. It was co-labor with God in rest. Do you remember we looked at that? But if we look again at the sixth day, we realize that God's command to them wasn't just be fruitful and multiply. It was rule over and subdue creation. In other words, humanity was given authority over creation. The fruitfulness of their co-laboring, it wasn't, it wasn't undertaken in any way other than and expressed through authority. God gave them his authority to subdue the created order. So in short, they had authority over every circumstance. Okay, that's, that's what he intended for us. In the Hebrews passage, and we are literally only scratching the surface here, we see an important link between rest, salvation, and Eden. So here the writer of Hebrews notes that it was not to angels that God gave authority to subdue the earth, but to humans who, it says, are lower than the angels, and yet God crowned us with glory and honor and put everything under our feet. Whoa. And so it continues to note that in our salvation, Jesus was made lower than the angels for a little while. And he was crowned with glory and honor so that through him, the crowns, crowns being like royalty and legitimate authority and governing power that we lost would be returned to us. And now we are crowned again with glory and honor. It says that Jesus, the pioneer of our salvation, has brought many sons and daughters to glory. So we, we didn't read it, but in, in, in later in Hebrews 4, the writer zeroes in on Sabbath rest and talks about how we have entered rest again through Jesus. Headline, our salvation has restored us to rest. And we read then in Hebrews 2, that we are now part of God's family, which means that as sons and daughters, we have an inheritance which includes the authority that Jesus has been given by his Father. Headline, our salvation has returned us to authority. Hey. This bit of Hebrews is all about salvation, rest, sonship, and authority. Are we following the thread so far? Okay. <laughs> You're so polite. Look, a couple of nodding heads and other people are like... Then we jumped to John 1 and read the glorious truth that those who believe in Jesus have been given the right to be called children of God. Let me just emphasize verse 12 again, okay? It says this, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The Berean liter literal Bible translation puts it this way, but as many as received him, he gave to them authority to be children of God. And the King James Version puts it this way, but as many as received him, to them he gave power to be children of God. Okay, so we're tracing the thread. John, next slide. Creation bestows rest, authority, and power. Salvation is the return to rest, authority, and power. Then we reread Psalm 46.10, which is a key verse in this series, be still and know that I'm God. And we learned a few weeks ago, if you remember that, to be still means to surrender so that God can have the victory, and to know means to cherish the presence of Holy Spirit in us. But we noted in getting to that translation that the words in that verse carry multiple meanings. So be still can mean stopping, waiting, and remaining. So we returned then we turn then to two important passages for Pentecost, Luke 24 and Acts 2. In Luke, the disciples are told to wait or to remain. It doesn't take too many linguistic gymnastics to find that the connotation in the language is rest. Rest until power comes. Wait. Remain. Rest in Jerusalem, and you will receive power. John, next slide, please. The word in, um, in that verse is um, dunamis, we know it. 
which means power, strength, majesty, might, ability, heavenly light, the working of miracles, spiritual power, supernatural administration, and authority. All wrapped up in that one word. Wait, remain, rest, and you will receive supernatural power and authority. Hey, back to Eden, back to ruling over and being fruitful, back to authority over circumstances. And then we finish with John 15. Remain or abide or rest in me and you will bear fruit, the fruitfulness of Genesis 1. He is in me, I am in him, the union and communion of the indwelling of the Spirit leads to authority and power. I hope I'm making sense. I'm trying to show you that there is a thread that started in Eden and was restored on the cross. That means that you, as a daughter and son, have been re-anointed with power and authority, which was always yours. But now it's just that in Christ Jesus, you have it through the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. Happy Pentecost. Your salvation rest has restored you to a place of administrative authority, right? You get to make the rules and spiritual power over your circumstances. I get excited by this because I see lots and lots and lots of Christians, the way I put it is under the weather, me included. We spend so much time under the weather of our circumstances And he, through the blood of his son on the cross, which incidentally was a big deal for Jesus, it's kind of what the whole thing's about, has restored us to a place of being above the weather. Right? The weather's under our feet. You get to stand on the clouds. Sounds like a song from the Beatles or something. (sighs) And what I've been trying to communicate in this series is that the power and authority that is available to you, right, the way to access it is to enter his rest by cherishing Holy Spirit in you. So please elevate your understanding of what rest is, right? It is the doorway to your spiritual authority. John, next slide, please. Authority flows from rest. That's the spiritual law for you guys today. That phrase on the screen is what I want you to take away. Authority flows from rest. Okay, so that was like a roller coaster, fasten your seatbelts, trip through a little bit of scripture there to try and establish what the cross has opened up for us, a return to authority that flows from rest over your circumstances. Be empowered today. It's Pentecost for goodness sake. This is the second part of this sermon. We're going to look at how Jesus exercised authority from rest. So if you would like to open your Bible, if that helps, but it will appear on the screen, we're going to go to a very familiar story in Mark 4, 35 to 41. Says this. That day, it's very, is that small? Can you read that or is that too small? Is it okay? Okay, excellent. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified, bless them, and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. It's very clear here that the disciples react to the storm by immediately relying on the flesh, right? On what they can physically do to change their external circumstances. 
It may look on first reading that they are turning to Jesus because they have faith in him, but that isn't actually what's happening here at all. They are in full panic mode, looking to what can humanly be done. So the scene is that they are, they are overwhelmed by their circumstances. They're motivated by fear. Their faith is at rock bottom, and the result is that they are striving. That's what relying on the flesh looks like. And as I've said many times before, because it really is key to our salvation, uh, Jeremiah and Galatians tell us that the flesh is under a curse. Relying on the flesh, that's cursed. And Jesus died on the cross in such a way it says that he became every curse. He became the curse for us. Relying on the flesh, it leads to spiritual death. Relying on the spirit leads to life. So Jesus took the curse on himself so that we could enter rest. And as long as you rely on your flesh when you are in a storm, in your, on your own resources, on what you think you can do to change your circumstances, you will continue to be restless. It's interesting how um, Jesus responds to the disciples as they demonstrate reliance on the flesh. Uh, he calls out their fear. Why are you afraid? And he shows them that their lack of faith is a big problem. And then he models authority that flows from rest. So we're going to look at that now. Rather than flapping and relying on the flesh, what is Jesus doing? He is resting. There is a huge contrast between the disciples and Jesus here. They are striving. He is at rest. Rest is the opposite of striving. Then Jesus says to the disciples, have you no faith? John, next slide, please. Rest flows from faith. Rest flows from faith. It's found in the realm of the spirit, not the flesh, not the world, not by turning to our circumstances and searching there. Faith is key if we are to operate out of rest rather than striving. And a lack of faith will always lead you to striving and self-reliance. Particularly, you know what it's like? When you, look, when you look at yourself, that's the place where faith dies. But when you look at the Holy Spirit, that's the place where faith explodes. Rest. Faith results in rest. Now, what is the difference in how Jesus reacts to the crisis of the storm versus the disciples. So the disciples are panicking and they are crippled by fear. They're in real trouble and they are about to be overwhelmed by the sea. Jesus, on the other hand, rebukes the storm and the storm stops. And note the reaction of the disciples. They do not say, this man is surely the son of God. Their revelation at this stage is the authority that Jesus carries. Who is this that the wind and waves obey him? Who is this who has authority over the elements? Their revelation is his authority over their circumstances. Are you following? Heading, application. Think about a storm in your life right now. Whatever it is, work, relationships, illness. Whatever the storm is, have you got one? Here's something to think about as you picture Jesus resting in the stern of the boat. In this spiritual law, spiritual authority flows from rest. So the question I ask you is, are you resting in your storm or are you striving? Because you can only take authority over that storm if you are resting in it. John, can you throw up the next one? You can only take authority over the storm you are resting in. See, rest settles our hearts before the Lord, and it results in a revelation. 
of who he is and who we are, right? It results in a revelation that as children of God, we carry the Father's anointing. We carry the Father's authority. And if you want breakthrough in the situations you are facing, the answer is not to rely on the flesh, because that comes from a place of fear. It's the result of a lack of faith, and it will leave you striving in your own strength. The answer is to start with faith, even if you've got like a tiny bit, a mustard seed, and enter rest by cherishing Holy Spirit in you. And in resting, you will receive revelation of who God is and who you are. You'll be reminded of what the cross bought. And that revelation includes, as we see in our passage, a revelation of his authority and the authority you carry by the Spirit as a son or daughter. Rest always results in a revelation of spiritual authority. The revelation of the authority that you carry, and I'm not talking about this, I'm talking about this as usual, this comes out of encounter with Holy Spirit. You need a revelation. You don't need to go, yes, I've got authority, and then go to work tomorrow and think, I don't have authority. You need encounter with Holy Spirit, which is why all of this stuff is about cherishing his indwelling presence. But the thing about receiving a revelation, which is from God, not from your understanding, okay? So you have to welcome that revelation. You have to be diligent in receiving a revelation that will transform your life. The key thing about it is that what you receive revelation of, what you realize you carry, you are then positioned to release. And this is the link that brings the authority that we're talking about into the realm of this world, and you start to release it. So it is Pentecost. We know that the ministry of the gospel is not just words, but power. It is a ministry of seeing breakthrough in the storms that surround us, okay? So how do you release your authority over the circumstances of your life? Well, I've always been taught that Scripture shows us that God's authority is not a theological theory. It's a substance. It's a substance in the spiritual realm. So... Jesus' power, it says, goes out from him when the woman with the issue of blood touches him. And he feels it go. And it stops him in his tracks. And the woman is healed. Peter and James, walking into the temple, come across the crippled man. And Peter doesn't say, I don't have any money, but I'll pray for you. He says, I don't have any money, but I will give you what I have. He knows what he's carrying spiritual authority to release the kingdom into that situation. Does that make sense? I know this is a jump, right? If you do not realize the authority that you carry, you cannot operate in it. You can't use what you don't realize you possess. You aren't positioned to release it. Striving, which we have talked about, is a key feature of a restless heart utterly stops us from realizing what we carry. But rest, being the product of faith, is the doorway to an awareness of the authority that we carry. If we live in ignorance of what we possess, we're in danger of being overwhelmed by the storm. Jesus operated out of a rest that testified to his knowledge of what he carried. He knew he had authority over the storm, so he stands up and he rebukes it, and the storm stops. What's the key? The key is rest. You surrender and you cherish Holy Spirit in you. You decide to reject the narrative of the world. You stop striving and you rest into a revelation of the authority that the Father has already made available to you through the finished work of his Son. And from that place, just like Jesus, you rebuke and you declare. You come against the culture the world, the storm, the enemy, and you declare, you partner with, you release the authority of the kingdom because you are in a place of rest and you're flowing in spiritual authority. I'm going to conclude with this. In light of this series, just bear with me on this, but imagine there are two ways to live. One way is to be unsettled 
by the restlessness of the heart and bullied by the demands of the culture. Such a person reacts to the world around them. They've succumbed to external expectations. They're exhausted and pressured. They carry false identity and false responsibility. They spin plates, fearful that they will drop one at any moment, letting themselves down or letting others down. So they strive in their own strength, dashing about to keep those plates spinning. They think that rest is about getting a break. They're self-orientated. They haven't understood that this isn't about entering their rest, it's about entering God's rest. The to-do list is overwhelming. They are distant from God, but they just can't get past the paradigm that things have to move aside to make more room for Jesus. So they shuffle the priorities in the hope that they can fit him in, and then they fail and feel condemned. They are the orphan-hearted, tossed about by the waves that have been the image that have accompanied this series. Their faith is too shallow to withstand the depth of the water. Theirs is a powerless life in which circumstances throw all the fullness of the world's weight upon them. Life should be better than this. They just don't seem to have the time or energy to work out how. Then there is the one who has entered God's rest. They've learned to honor the presence of Holy Spirit in them. He's their priority, so they're diligent in protecting their connection with him. Their main lens on life is not the to-do list, but cherishing Holy Spirit. They've lived to learn. They've learned to live in inner solitude. They've quieted their hearts. They live and pray in encounter. Their identity is not orphan, but son, so they are free from striving, performance, false responsibility, fear, and unholy measures of success. They can decide which plates to stop spinning because they have perspective. And in the spinning, they're not fearful of a plate falling because they don't put their identity in how well they can keep something going or how much they can achieve. Rather than reacting to the world, they respond to it from a seat of rest. They have power over their circumstances. Their circumstances do not have power over them. They have authority, so their circumstances do not rule over them. So they don't dream of a fantasy life where things are one day less hectic, busy, or demanding. Rather, they're thankful for the life they have and do everything unto the Lord who is the joy of their salvation. Their faith is an anchor in the storm. So no matter how big the waves seem, they can settle their hearts before him and enter rest from which their authority flows. And from there, they declare the kingdom. Two ways of living. May I commend to you the latter. It's time for you to leave behind your old life and come into a true understanding of the way that Jesus wants you to live in light of your salvation, your sonship, and his finished work. Amen.